Thank you everybody for joining me today for this uh, webinar on warehouses. Thank you for taking time out of your day. So uh, here's our outline that we're gonna step through. We'll start with uh, considerations and challenges of warehouses. And then we'll take a quick detour on and describe some of the GOPR systems that are relative to supporting warehouse structures. And we'll step back a little bit and discuss some of the traditional foundation and slab support options. And then go through some of the GOPR foundation and slab support options and, and why those can be beneficial. And then we'll dig into a little bit of the overview and methodology. And then wrap it up with some case histories. So why warehouses? Why are we talking about warehouses? Imagine you've seen some of these names before. Amazon, Walmart are, are two big competitors out there. Um, Smithfield, if you've grilled out here anytime recently, or Kraft, if you've uh, been in quarantine and made a grilled cheese sandwich here lately, or maybe you have some bath products uh, at home, you know, if you've seen the name Unilever before. Um, so these are all big names, and obviously the bigger the name, the bigger the, the warehouse um, likely. So these structures are becoming more and more prevalent, especially um, especially here lately with this with quarantine. So if we look at some of the two of the biggest competitors, Amazon and Walmart, where they located, so you can see they're kind of focused here in the high population areas along the east and west coasts, and then around the Great Lakes area, and then kind of peppered here in the middle and between um, south and then on the interior. I guess so, so why is that important? You're gonna have warehouses with variable soil conditions all over the United States. So just an idea of where these things are located. And so what do these structures look like? This is a kind of a typical foundation plan. Um, so if you consider, if you're looking here, this is about a 50 foot base spacing by 30 foot. So it ends up being, this type of structure is, is about a thousand feet lengthwise and about 500 feet width. So that ends up being about half a million square feet. Some are larger, some are smaller, but just in general, that, that's kind of the typical size. So you can see there's quite a lot of footings located here. Um, depending on the size and allowable bearing capacity, you might be considering a lot of um, stress in your soil below these foundations. Um, you can also see uh, the um, shear walls and or brace frames uh, on the sides here, those are taking the transient loads. And then um, we'll talk about later also slab loads, depending on the structure, you may have both um, slab loads and fo high foundation loads to consider. So some of the major considerations when we first start looking at these structures is the base spacing, as I discussed, and that's relative to the heavy column loads and overlapping stress. So all these three um, kind of go together. So if you have um, large footings and heavy column loads, the stresses are gonna be driven deeper um, and overlapping stress may play a major role to understand what kind of settlement tolerances you're looking at um, for these type of structures. And the other consideration um, is slab loading and or rack loads. If you kind of take a look at these pictures here, um, you can see between the, the base spacing here, where you have a column here and then one further out, you, you like if you can see, you can have some uh, draping of the slab in between the columns. And so you can see it's settling more under the load that was there. Um, you don't want that. And if you look up here, if you had a better eyesight here, you would see the undulating of the slab as you look down the, the pathway here. That's a, an, another result of excess settlement um, and cracking um, under these type of rack loads. So that, based on that soil behavior, it becomes a, um, plays a major role in understanding um, how these trucks are gonna behave. So performance criteria, um, as with most structures, the differential settlement between columns is gonna be the major driver. Um, one inches, two inches is typical. You can have a more robust um, foundation support system and a less robust um, structural design or kind of the vice versa um, as, as far as foundation. So for the slab, as I discussed, you can have a uniform slab uh, or maybe variable um, 
slab support where you have rack loads. So maybe you have high point loads in certain areas, and then at a, at a given spacing over the slab itself. And the other thing to consider is if there's going to be fill going in on site, you certainly don't want to build the structure as the fill is settling, because that could certainly affect your performance criteria. We'll discuss that more later on as well. So some of the geotechnical considerations here. So overall, site characterization is important. You want to understand uh, if you have undocumented fill on site, how deep is it? Um, does your design uh, foundation support design, does it need to penetrate through that undocumented fill? What are the strength characteristics of it? Um, you also want to understand uh, the grading on the site. Understand, is it near a slope? Do you need to consider stability? And then just the overall geologic considerations, alluvial, colluvial, is it residual type soils? Just to understand, um, plays all that plays a role into understanding how the soil is going to behave under these type of loading conditions. And then boring coverage, um, generally looking for something like maybe one boring for every 100 by 100 square feet. Uh, so one for every 10,000 square feet for, for these type of structures. Maybe the soil is more uniform and you don't need as much, or maybe the soil is more variable and you need more. I would say work with your local geotechnical engineer to um, to, to parse out uh, what kind of coverage might be needed on any given site. And the depth can be important, especially if you have um, slab loads on these structures. Um, you have maybe a heavy load over a large area. You, it's good to understand that that stress is going to be driven deeper and understand if you have soft compressible soils with depth, you want to find a competent material uh, on where potentially um, the settlements might start to ramp down. And then uh, lab data and then OCR consolidation tests, all of this information plays a role in understanding fine grain type soils. So um, consolidation tests or CPT correlations are important to understand what kind of OCR you might be seeing from these soils. And then if you par pair that with Atterberg limits and moisture contents, all that paints a picture for you to understand the compressibility of those soils. So you can see my little segue down here. That's my cue to kind of switch gears a little bit. So those are kind of the design considerations. Um, when we first look at these projects, uh, just kind of a bird's eye view of how we start to understand these, these structures. And so now we'll segue here over to some of the wrap options that we have in our toolbox. So you see the four systems here, the first one being the GP3 system. This is kind of our bread and butter. So you would say this is a kind of a drill and fill system. So you can see the drill here and then our tamper here. And so it drills out to design depth and then loose lifts of about three to four feet of aggregate are placed. And then the tamper comes in um, building those compacted lifts all the way to the, the bottom of the foundation or slab. The impact and ramp pack system, you see these two, um, these are what we call displacement systems. Um, you can see the mandrel here and the hopper on top and I'll describe that more in detail later. So there's no need for casing on this. And so it displaces the soils and these are good in sands or caving soils. And then the X1 system is kind of a hybrid. I'll describe that more in detail as well. So the GP3 system, it's a pretty slick system. So you need three, four people. And if you include a QC representative, and so you have a, the GeoPeer drill a skid steer. So this is bringing the rock to and from um, the stockpiles and then placing it in the loose lifts. And then an operator here for, for the tamper to build those lifts up and compacted. So it's pr pretty quick, safe, clean, drawn process. There's no water jetting or anything. So your, your site stays clean. And kind of the process here, what it looks like, as I described, you're excavating out the, the cavity drilling out, you're coming in with your first um, loose lift of aggregate. You can see the tamper here is dropped into the hole, and then you're tamping that lift down into a compacted lift, and it's getting this nice lateral stress buildup into those in situ soils. So you, you end up with a really high stiffness pier 
um, ag aggregate element. So then for the X1 system, you can see this is on a different rig. This is a, a mass rig, so it's much, much more robust. And so, but it can also go deeper up to 20, 45 feet. Pre-drilling is typically required for the system as well, though. Um, you're not coming in out of the hole. The mandrel can stay in the hole and the aggregate can keep flowing and it's stroke pattern up and down in order to build the lifts. And I'll show you that on the next slide here. So it's good. It can be good in in caving soils to a certain extent. Um, sands, it, it can be used as displacement as well. So it, it's, it's a pretty versatile system. You can see these are the X1 mandrels. Um, they're all pretty much constructed the same. So you can see if you're looking down um, from the top here, you can see the chains hanging down. And then on the mandrel head, here's another view. So as the rock flows and the, the ch chains are, are loose, it flows through the chains and then through the stroke pattern, maybe you, you pull up four feet and then drive down two feet. And so as you pull up that four feet, those chains loosen up, the aggregate falls down and the, the redrive on the, on the second end will create that, that compaction surface as the chains bind up. And that helps to, to build a stiff pier and force those soils laterally and down. So then the displacement systems, you can see it's not too dissimilar from the X1 systems. You have the hopper up top, the vibratory hammer, and then the mandrel. So you can see the extender arm here drops in the aggregate. It flows down through the mandrel and through that same process where it's dropping through the chains and then into the uh, compaction head, it's creating that stiff pier through that stroke pattern um, build process. So you can see here with the hopper, this is how I described, and then maybe it's a four to five. You can vary the stroke pattern based on the soil conditions and how stiff the, the pier needs to be built. You can see here's a better view of kind of how the chains are hanging down. You can see you got a good cavity there where the, the stone flows through. And if you imagine as this drives back down, these chains bind up and create a stiff compaction surface. So typically this is done in, in two foot lifts. So same, same as the X1, about 45 feet this can extend to. Um, it's good for brown brownfield sites where you're, it may be contaminated. Um, once again, with sand sites where you have caving, this displacement process creates good densification in, in those soils. And it's a fa fairly quick process um, with the one operator there and then the, um, the, the gentleman that will be extending the arm to drop in the aggregate. It's a pretty pretty small crew, so you can get about 40 to 100 peers a day. So with that in mind, some of the wrap benefits um, for warehouse type structures. So you can generally look at using a flexible slab, which is something you would also use for maybe an, an over X option where you have a uniform subgrade. Um, so you're, you don't need a robust um, structural slab for this type of system. The piers can be in direct contact with the slab. And so you're not having to create a, a, a thick, maybe 12 inch thick slab with, with a lot of reinforcement for support of um, high slab loads. And then consider also that piers can be installed before or after new fill. So stay tuned on that. I'll, I'll kind of go into the uh, pros and cons of, of uh, those two thoughts. So then for the foundations, um, our peers can provide a, an increased allowable bearing capacity. So you can generally increase maybe a, a two or three KSF type uh, in situ native bearing allowable um, bearing capacity up to something more on the order of five or six KSF and shrink those fo footings quite a bit, saving on your con concrete costs. And so we design those in-house here to limit total and differential settlement. And, and as noted before, on all the systems, are, they're all pretty slick and uh, pretty agile, so it's, they're easy to get in and get out on sites and, and clean with no water jetting. And a lot of things some people ask about is, can they be installed with uplift anchors? The answer is yes. So some of these warehouses might have some winds or earthquake transient loading. 
um, especially on, on some of those brace frames or shear walls. So the answer is yes, we can certainly um, provide resistance to those uplift loads. Okay, so now we'll backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the traditional options just for comparison. So if we just take this general example here, maybe you have a, uh, a soft compressible layer that you're going to be um, your bearing layer for your foundations and slab, and then something uh, co confident a, a little deeper. So option one, deep foundations. So you can certainly um, design to extend th through the soft layers and into the competent material. Um, you have pile caps up, up here, obviously, for that will need to be designed. Um, depending on how deep you're going and the loads, it might be quite expensive, but you're certainly gonna get a good performance out of that typically, as long as it's designed properly. So that's just one option for your foundations. Another option, over excavation and replacement. So for foundations, depending on your base spacing, you can see you may, as you're benching back here, and then in order to excavate the soils out um, within the influence zone of the footings, you may end up you know, excavating out very close to one another, and it might just be ending up having to hog out the whole um, soft compressible zone below the footprint, which can, of course, be expensive. The other questions you need to consider are where's the import material going to come from? Where's your groundwater table? Um, do you need a dewatering program to make sure you can excavate these soils and replace them properly? Also, you can get good performance of this, but the, as, as typical, money is the, the driver here. So for slab support, you can also look at deep foundations. So you would have a structural slab, pretty robust system up top, and then you would have deep foundations at a given spacing extending to competent soils below. So as long as it's designed properly, it's it's likely going to end up being fairly thick. You can get good performance out of it. The question is how expensive it's going to be, the equipment and material logistics of mobilizing typically large rigs to extend down to deeper soils, and then the effort it takes to design a, a more robust system for the structural slab, depending on what type of loads these structures um, will be designed for. So if we look at this in a little more detail, this is a, a general graph that we've created based on our experience over the years between the, um, the cost differences between deep foundations and wraps. So if you look in blue here and we take this as a design example, so you have a 40 foot pile length and maybe 125 kip capacity that you're able to achieve based on that length. You're falling in this blue zone here. You would, you would suspect that the wrap cost savings would increase based, based on that depth. The other thing to consider is that you're likely going to save more money with a wrap option um, just based on the quicker installation time. So if we look at kind of the opposite here, maybe you have a 30 foot long pile and you're going to get 150 kip capacity. You might say, hmm, maybe the wrap savings is not going to be as much there. But the other things to consider, as I mentioned before, is the installation time. And a lot of these warehouses are are schedule driven, so I think that, that plays an important role in on the deciding factor of what system foundation and slab support system is used. So we always um, say price both and evaluate the cost benefit. And so your option two over excavation and replacement, kind of another design example here. So you've got your soft compressible soil. Um, in this design example, I'm saying that's about six feet. So if you calculate kind of the the trapezoid here, you're going to end up excavating about 306,000 uh, cubic feet of soil. And then this kind of varies obviously from place to place around the country. You say on average maybe about 27 yards per cubic feet to remove and replace. So that, that's going to price you at about 306k. You know the questions to consider are where is the groundwater table? Are you going to need to dewater? And what's the compaction requirement and the time and effort it takes to make sure that's achieved? The other option here, of course, is geopier. And so the piers extending six feet 
And then if I take a conservative eight feet on center design, I'm estimating about 625 elements. And based on our typical pricing, you probably see somewhere around the um, around 130K for your price tag. So you can see a pretty significant savings even at this short uh, six, six foot excavation depth. So unless you have maybe two to three feet of, um, of soft soils to dig out, we're typically gonna price, price well against the remove and replace option. So option three is surcharge and settlement monitor. If you have deep, um, soft compressible soils, this is often a good option. The, um, the major holdup on this one would be the waiting time and settlement monitoring period. Do you have the time to wait for this to, um, for your soft compressible soils to settle out and gain strength over that time? That's a big question mark with these warehouses where the scheduling is often the driver. Um, the other question to consider is where you're, where you're going to get those soils and um, the time it takes to get them in and out of sight and the cost that that takes. So those are your traditional foundation um, and slab support options. If we now take a little bit deeper dive into the wrap options here, this is diagram just to kind of move forward to keep in mind. So we're defining the upper zone here as the, the reinforced zone where your piers will extend through and then they'll tag a lower zone here, um, a more competent material. And so when you add the upper zone and lower zone settlement together, that defines the total settlement of the system. And so if we look at a little at the upper zone a little closer, if you remember back from your statics class, we used Hooke's law here. And so you just have your stress and then your influence factor based on the depth of interest and the thickness of that layer divided by your elastic modulus value. And consider that this elastic modulus value if G appear reinforced comes from this equation. And so you're taking the stiffness of your peer and then relative to the stiffness of the improved matrix soils. And the RA here is defined as the area ratio relative to the area that your peers replaced under a given footing or unit slab cell area. So that's the upper zone, the lower zone. If you remember from your geotechnical classes, it's no different than consolidation theory or um, estimating through correlations a, uh, an equivalent elastic modulus value. Um, representative of the site soils, maybe you have to layer it out, um, but you're using your geotechnical practices here to estimate the lower zone. So that's kind of the approach for um, foundation support. If we look at slab support, here's kind of the two traditional conditions here. You have a uniform soil support, maybe this is your surcharge or your over X and replace option and you end up with a pretty uniform uh, 1 km value for the whole slab for the structural engineer to design their slab. The other option is a deep foundation. Maybe you have peat or some very soft soils, and then you need a robust uh, structural slab and deep foundation to extend through that. And so this type of system would be for those site conditions. So now if we look at kind of the wrap options here, this um, matrix here is to kind of go through the, the next few steps. Um, if you consider with no fill and then with fill, and then we'll talk about the geotechnical and structural considerations for each. So just keep these in mind as we move forward and I'll step through each one. So case one with no fill, oops, excuse me. Case one, no fill geotechnical considerations. So if you just picture here, the wrap elements in direct contact with the slab, um, you would consider these wrap elements to be stiff springs. And then between you have less stiff springs based on the improved um, matrix soils after peer installation. So that's just kind of what's pictured here. So how do we analyze this? So step one, we assume that, first of all, assume the slab is rigid. And then based on the floor pressure, here Q, 
RS being the stiffness ratio between the piers themselves and the matrix soil. And then RA being, as I described earlier, the area ratio, the replacement of the piers relative to the matrix soil. And then I'll give you kind of the top of pier stress for that soil. If you take that divided by your estimated pier stiffness, so maybe this is KSF and your pier, pier stiffness is PCI typically, you end up with your, your settlement in the upper zone. So typically, if you were to you know, use your Q as something in a commercial building of 150 or 200 PSF, it's going to tell you that your spacing can be pretty wide. But keep in mind that that assumes that the slab is rigid. So the second consideration here, the last slide we were just talking about upper zone settlement. So the other thing to consider here is lower zone settlement. This is important with heavy slab loads over large areas. You're going to have deep influence with, with that type of loading. So we would calculate that upper zone settlement and then take a harder look at the lower zone settlement consolidation tests or um, our elastic modulus cor correlations. So that was the geotechnical considerations for case two. Um, case two, now let's look at the structural considerations. So if you just kind of picture the slab here and how it might behave. And so if this diagram here relative to the, the FEA diagram here, if you picture our piers here, on each corner and each little, uh, I want to say that that's purple, excuse my color blindness, but um, so that each little quarter here of your pier, and then you can see you have some high punching and shear stresses and they dissipate as you move away from the pier. And then you have some more bending stresses here in between the piers. So these are kind of the hard spots mentioned there. And so the structural engineer evaluates based on um, the pier stiffness, and then the reduced pier stiffness as you move away from the pier and in order to design the slab thickness and reinforcement. So other considerations here for, for the case two structural, um, assuming a uniform pressure, if there's point loads, those would need to be evaluated separately. Um, the geoper elements are centered on the control joint to to mitigate any of the moments that, that the slab might be subjected to. And so we would typically do work directly with the structural engineer to design this slab relative to the pier stiffness and the matrix soil stiffness to hone in on, a, on an efficient slab design. You can see here, just for comparison, the, the deep foundation option, you, you obviously you're typically gonna be going much deeper than, than a wrap option. So this is just the visualization of what I was describing. So you have your stiff springs being the wrap elements here. And as you move away from the pier towards the center, you have less and less stiff of a spring. As the wrap element is installed, you get, you get good improvement um, right next to the pier. And as you move further away, it, you get less and less improvement. So what drives the design is the spacing and then the load and settlement that is estimated uh, at the center of the wrap uh, element spacing. So just a design example here, say we have a six inch slab, saw cut joint. So you can see the geoper element right here at the center of the, of the saw cut joints. Um, I think this slab was designed for maximum stress of, I think, around 300 uh, PSI. So you can see here some of the red areas are around 200 PSI. You can see the highest stresses, the bending stresses, are between the elements um, where you might have some, some high bending stresses. So in this case, we ended up only with about a tenth of an inch of settlement. And so at the end of the day, we were able to say, yes, our design holds relative to the design of this relatively thin slab. All right, case three. So this, these, these moving forward are, are based on um, if you have a site where you're, you're going to be putting in new fill, you have the option of putting in piers in before the new fill is placed. So if that's the case, you end up with arching between your pier and then the, the floor um, load at the top. 
And so that arching is defined by alpha, typically between 45 and 60 degrees, which is taken from the horizontal. And so what drives here, as I mentioned before, is if these arches intersect, then you have a uniform support condition and your peers are taking the full floor, floor load um, from the slab and then dissipating them within the pier itself. The other consideration of it is shown in this diagram is if they aren't touching, we need to estimate the settlement within this zone and the transfer, the amount of stress that's transferred through this zone and between the piers. That's that's what will drive the um, variable stiffness values that we provide to the structural for design. So you can see illustrated a little bit more. In this case, do we have uniform support? No, um, but the design still holds. We work with the structural um, to understand what kind of spring stiffnesses we use, and you're still able to use a relatively thin slab up top. So this is kind of a, the illustrated transfer mechanism and kind of the equation we, we would use to determine the thickness and if we have full arching and the spacing um, that dictates our design. So you're looking at the alpha here with the horizontal angle relative to if, the, if these intersect or not to understand if you're capturing all the load of the slab. Okay, so that wraps up the kind of design and methodology. Um, hope that helps understand how the wrap elements are designed uh, for structural foundation and slab support of these warehouses. I'm gonna to try to tie it, tie it up together here with these case histories I've got. The first one here um, is a pretty large warehouse in the Midwest, a very fast paced project client was demanding and um, this was very schedule driven. So you, you can see here we have pretty high column loads, about a thousand kips. Uh, base spacing similar to the uh, the very first foundation plan I showed you, about 27 by 51 feet, very pretty light wall loads and a relatively low slab pressure. Um, and we work with the structural to develop a total settlement criteria of about two inches on this one. So you can see just from the overview of this slab here, you have obviously quite a few footings. It's hard to tell what size these are, but you're likely going to have um, some overlapping stress here. So immediately the thought goes to what kind of um, soils are, are below these foundations and how compressible are they under these loads. All right, so to complicate things a little more here, we have quite a bit of grading on this site. We're cutting about nine feet from the, the western portion and then moving a significant portion of it to the eastern portion, so up to about 15 feet of fill here. So you can imagine that's a pretty high stress going in on the in-situ soils there. So we dug into uh, to get a deeper understanding of the soils to make sure this, this building is going to perform as needed. And so here's kind of a cross section of what I was just showing you relative to the, uh, the soil site conditions. So you can see this layer here that we've highlighted. This is a lacustrian soil. And so you've got blow counts of five, four, six. So it's medium stiff, probably at best in most cases. And so when you put about 15 feet of fill on that, how much is it going to compress? And then how's it going to behave after we put that 15 feet of fill in? So we looked at that in pretty good detail to understand what, uh, what, what would work best on this side as far as our design and approach. So just to dig a little more into kind of what, what the matrix I showed you before, as far as the pros and cons of um, putting the your peers in before the fill or after the fill. So if you if you want to put your peers in prior to the fill placement, um, you're obviously going to speed up consolidation time because you have the drainage to your peers. Um, if, if you're talking about clay, clay fine grain soils, and you're going to have shorter piers because you're not having to extend your piers through that new fill. Some of the cons is that it's going to require time for pier installation. Uh, 
more time and you're only going to be able to size the foundations um, for the bearing capacity of that structural fill if they're not in direct contact with our elements. If you come in after fill placement, you can start grading immediately, obviously, and then we can come in and reinforce those soils and provide, provide a higher bearing capacity for those foundations and shrink those footings down. The downside is it requires um, fill-induced settlement. Um, it takes a little bit longer for that to occur because you may not have our, our piers there for, to, for additional drainage. And you're going to be extending through that new fill as well, so that they'll likely be a little bit longer. So the question is, what works best with this project schedule? So based on this this being a uh, a, pro a schedule driven project, um, it was and working with the geotechnical engineer, um, it was understood that the native soils would compress pretty rapidly even without our peers installed first. So it was more of a benefit to the client that we could shrink down their footings, provide still a good bearing capacity with the structural fill, and, and then control settlement to the specified uh, based on the structural engineer. So then here's kind of the detailed analysis. You can see this is just a uh, uh, a subtle 3D of the foundation footprint. So we analyzed the overlapping stresses um, very thoroughly to, uh, to make sure we understood how those lacustrian soils would compress. And then the result of this kind of analysis um, helped us understand that the lacustrian, um, after the placement of that 15 feet of fill would have been highly compressible. So we ended up extending our piers through that material in order to control the settlement to two inches. Without that, the, um, the structure would have likely has seen significant more settlement. So here's kind of a, a cool video we, we set up for this project. You can see here in the golden fields of the Midwest somewhere. I'll talk you through it here as it plays. So you got quite a few piers here, 7,600 piers are going fairly deep, 35 to 40 feet to get those through those lacustrian soils. This is the impact system, uh, kind of a, a schematic here. So you can see a displacement system. The aggregate falls through and it's building those compacted lifts and, and stroke patterns. There it is there. You can see the hopper up top and the, the aggregate being dumped in. You can see it's a quite a large site. The GC had it ready for us. And once we got on site, we were rocking and rolling. You can see the drill in action down there. And so that was relative to the X1 system here. So we use kind of a combination of both of them, depending on if we saw caving on portions of the site. So you can see it functions much the same way as the impact system. The aggregate falls through, and then there's a, a stroke pattern applied to construct and compacted lifts. You can see the hopper there. And then the skid steer bringing the aggregate through. So it's a quick process. You see them here working 24 seven to get this thing done. You can see the bird's eye view there. Yeah, you can see kind of why the, the client wanted this in the ground sooner than later with that snow coming. And there's the foundations coming in right after pretty much the next day after these piers were installed. So you can see the benefit to, to getting these um, these wrap elements in compared to deep foundations. There certainly would have been a significant um, time delay to get a deep foundation system in there. So just a shout out here to our licensee, Ground Improvement Engineering, and our uh, installer, FSC. So here's kind of the overview here. So the geotechnical challenge on this one was uh, was those high compressible soils. You had a lot of new fill going in and, ex and under an accelerated construction schedule. Um, as I mentioned, the geotechnical engineer determined that fill induced settlement would, would happen relatively quick. So we were able to reinforce um, through that new fill and provide um, 
uh, high bearing capacities footing so you can see relative to what they would have been they're fairly small all right so that was case history one you can see that one was kind of driven by the high column loads and uh, the GOPR reinforcement to control settlement of those column loads. This one is more slab driven. So you can see it's still a large building. You've got uh, about 20, 222,000 um, square feet here. Column loads are pretty light though on the order of 150 kips or less. So you can see it's mostly driven, the design is mostly driven by the slab. So in this freezer warehouse area, you have about 900 PSF. So this, if you can imagine, is kind of a storage freezer warehouse area. And then this is kind of the truck dock where the trucks will pull up here on this end and the product will be transferred from this area into the freezer warehouse. So what are the, some of the challenges here? So if you can see the profile, we've got a soft silt in the upper zone here, finished floor. It's a little bit above the existing grade, so you have a little bit of fill going in, a semi-high high groundwater table with blow counts here, anywhere from five to four. Maybe you have a little bit of stiff, but for the most part, it looks soft, medium stiff. And based on what we're seeing in the logs, you have some caving potential in that material. Okay, so, Based on, on those soil conditions, we wanted to make sure we understood um, how that silt would behave um, once that 900 PSF slab pressure was applied there. That was most important on this job. So we had good lab data that worked with the geotechnical engineer and uh, they ran some good testing and helped us understand how these soils would behave with some, um, with some UUs, some consolidation tests, and then some additional um, Atterberg limits to, to paint the whole picture for us. And so you have those highly compressible silts in the upper zone. You add five, six feet of fill there, and they're going to settle quite a bit. So you would think the best option might be deep foundation. You, you saw that good uh, sand layer down there about 25, 30 feet deep. Um, but based on the, the structural slab that would need, be, would need to be created, um, in order to limit the punching stress of those foundations, um, Geopair was able to able to come in and thin that slab up and still provide the settlement control and cracking control for the slab that the, the client was looking for. So the question here becomes what um, did we install the piers before or after this new fill? And so based on the estimated time settlement of that silt and clay layer um, and the amount that was going in and the spacing that we were able to determine to support this 900 PSF pressure, it was determined that we were able to be more beneficial to come in before the new fill. And then you could see based on that, we were able to get pretty much full arching of the slab load down to our piers. So you had a uniform support condition for the slab. So based on that, when they placed the fill, the settlement monitoring happened fairly quick and the structural was able to design a relatively thin slab. So if you remember the X1 system that we, uh, we talked about prior, that's what was used here. So you had uh, the fill going in they would drill down a little bit. Maybe there were some caving and the X1 was able to, to drive down to design depth, tagging the sand down here and build the pier up from there. This is kind of what we ended up with. You have here in this 900 PSF area, about seven feet on center. And if you remember from the, the prior diagram, we were able to get full uniform arching of that slab load. And that helped significantly with uh, the slab design and to control cracking of that slab. So the client was pretty pleased with that. And then over here, kind of in the, the truck dock area, we were able to widen out a little bit more to seven, 10 feet on center based on the reduced load. So the results here, so we had a, a good efficient design 
got it in the ground quick, made the client happy. Um, we reduced that that settlement monitoring period down to a month. If you take a look at the data here from late April to late May, after that, it, it levels off pretty quickly. So we were able to expedite that settlement pretty quickly by coming in first before that new fill. And since then, the slab has performed well. We've gotten um, two or three callbacks from this client on expansions of this building. As you can see, this was the first one. And we they actually extended this warehouse out further if you're looking at the picture towards you. So uh, good performance and uh, good design and cost efficient. So the client was happy on this one. All right, so that, that about wraps it up. Um, so at the end of the day, may, you're maybe asking why GeoPeer. I would point toward kind of this last one here, heavy experience with these, uh, experience with these heavy loads matters. Um, on these warehouses, you have high column loads, maybe heavy slab loads. Um, a lot of these stresses ha have deep influences, and so you need to understand um, how those soils are going to behave relative. And the GeoPair system provides a good option to reinforce those and, you, and rely on our understanding of the soil and how they're going to behave with the local geotech experience. So wherever you're at in the country, you have a local rep close to you. And so you can reach us at geopair.com to find your local rep for any feasibility questions or answers. Don't be hesitant to reach out. I appreciate everybody taking the time on the call today. And thank you much.